Christmas Parkway Church. Please, on your way to be seated, if you could just turn around, shake someone's hand, and say Merry Christmas to them. My name is Eddie Rivera, and this is my wife. And we would like 
This is my wife, Janet Rivera. So hit the button, it might turn on. Might be good. All right. So I'm sure we were all busy yesterday running around getting some holiday shopping done. All those last minute deals. And I'm sure for most of the men here, Christmas shopping starts tomorrow. But with all the busyness of the holidays, let's not forget the true meaning of this season. And that is, it's the birth of our Savior. And if you are a first time guest, we would like to welcome you and thank you for joining us today. Yes, go ahead, it's a good clap. And then in front of the pews, or in the back of the pews, in front of you, and also on the corner of the balconies, there is a connect card. If you fill this out, put your name and information and you can bring it to the back. Um, you can see James and Jody Bentley and Annie Nye after church and they will greet you and tell you about all the great things we have going on in this church. Um, and we have a free gift for you and a free cup of coffee as well. Yes, also for the members that are here, if your information has changed, there's also a little checkbox that you can put and then drop it into the offering. Here at Parkway, we are a small group church. All right, this is how we really started. All right, and we got a series that's coming up in January. And do we know what that series is called? I love my church. Yes, yes, it's true. We do love our church. I encourage and I challenge everyone here, get involved, join a group, maybe even lead a group. This is where friendships and relationships are built. And then we'll go on with spiritual news. We do have some people that receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Um, Natasha Lee, Makaria, Sarah I, Sarah K, Ezekiel, Christopher, Ray, Hunter, and Shannon. Nice, let's give them a hand clap. This is awesome, this is what it's all about. And if we bow our heads, let's pray for the service. Jesus, we love you. We thank you. We thank you that we are able to come and freely worship you here in this place, Lord. We ask, Lord God, that you just have your way in the service. Bless the musicians. Bless the preaching, Lord God. And just be with us, Lord God. We thank you for all that you do and just praise you. It's in your precious name that we pray. Amen. And please, the announcement video. Good morning and Merry Christmas from Parkway Church. My name is Ty and I will be giving you a look at everything happening here at Parkway. Tonight we have Harp and Bowl at 6 p.m. right here in the sanctuary. Harp and Bowl is a time of prayer, praise, and communion for the entire family. We do want you to note that the Stillwaters Cafe will not be open after Harp and Bowl this evening. Starting on January 6th, we will be doing a small group sticky note series called I Love My Church. New groups can register out here in the main foyer after this service at the small groups kiosk. If you have any questions, you can see Kathy Lemberger. The 2019 Parkway Church Marriage Retreat will be taking place on February 22nd and 23rd at the Abbey Resort in Fontana. The speakers will be Reverend Brent and Rachel Cotharp. The cost is $200 per couple and you should register soon because space is limited. We also want you to know that right here at the Parkway Happenings Wall, we have some spiritual resources available bread, Bible reading charts, as well as fasting guides are available each Sunday here at the Parkway Happenings Wall. The first fruits offering for faith initiatives will be received on Sunday, January 6th. We ask that you prayerfully consider what God would have you give towards faith initiatives in 2019. As always, if you have any questions about anything that we've announced, you can pick up a 411 information sheet, stop by the Parkway Happenings Wall, or visit us online at www.theelcreekchurch.com. Now please enjoy this service. Let's go ahead and stand again this morning. This morning I'm so excited to come and worship the King of Kings, the one who came to save us. Amen. Let's come and adore him this morning. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. 
may be seated. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. That's why he was born. That's why he was born. And um, what a message and what a beautiful song service. What a great time of the year, isn't it? Amen. Don't you think people are, forget all of the craziness with the Coles 24 hours and the, I don't know, Walmart everywhere and I mean, isn't it just a great time of the year? Amen. Aren't you more sensitive, I think, to people? And, you know, that's what it's really about. When you have the Holy Ghost, you have a sensitivity. You should have a sensitivity to those around you and that are less fortunate than you are. I'm not up here to preach. I'm up here to just to receive an offering. But uh, before we do that, I'd like to talk a little bit about the Faith Initiatives Program that we'll be going into in 2019. Can you put this slide up for me, if you have it? Um, as you know, we're entering into a new year, and for those who you, of you who may not know, Faith Initiatives is the way that we raise funds, uh, and you make pledges, for all of the things over and above the regular tithes and offerings that we give out. Things that go for missionaries, and for uh, new beginnings, for local food pantries, for benevolence, for those who are in need of the church, uh, who have needs, financial needs, the church board is able to give them money out. And because of your faithfulness, we've way exceeded our goal this year. We're way over $200,000 that you've pledged. That's a, that's a testimony to you. And of course, we as a board uh, met this last week and, and uh, we're giving some more money out that you gave. Uh, Brother McLean, who is our missionary in Nigeria, has a need over there for a, a church with a roof and a shortfall in his budget. So we've allocated $10,000 out of, out of faith initiatives for him. Also, New Beginnings, which is an orphanage in uh, Mississippi, or Louisiana, that we give to, which is, a, which is our, our, in our fellowship, they had a need for a van. So we're able to put $7,500 towards that to help them with this van. <laughs> and we've increased our Christmas for Christ offering this year over and above what we normally give. We went over and above that because of your faithfulness. Just really, you deserve a hand clap for that. You really do. You know, this church is unique because I know, you know, I know Brother Green touched on it, the blab it and grab it, name it and claim it, that kind of gospel. That's not what we teach here. And we stopped all fundraising about four years ago, and we went to just a once-a-year pledge that we put before you, and we put a goal up. This year, the goal is $200,000 that we want to raise. And we're going to have our first fruits, first fruits offering, say that 10 times, <laughs> on January 6th. And if you haven't picked up the newspaper, this is outstanding. How many of you have picked it up and read it? I'm not trying to embarrass anybody, but pick it up. It is outstanding. And in the center is the challenge from Pastor about the coloring contest. Now, I had a little hint this morning that he was going to use our graphic department in church here to help him. So I disqualified that and said, you cannot do that. You have to color it yourself with regular crayons and compete. Right? Do you agree? Yes. So when you open up the center, I think it's page 11, you'll find the, the puzzle in there that you, or the picture you'll be able to color and compete. And that'll be turned in on February 3rd. So I want to show you what the pledge card looks like in here. 
This is the card that's inside of there and has the goal. And on the bottom of it is a cutoff where you mark down your pledge that you as a family, and yes, as a family, involve your children. You know, it's the best thing that you can do is involve them in what's going on in the church. You know, when you put the church the center of your family, everything will work out for you. Trust me, I know from experience. And uh, God will be faithful. But pray about it, and then bring your pledge cards on the 6th. And the reason we want to know that as a board, what you're going to pledge for this year, is because then as the needs come in, we will give the money out. And we'll give out every dime that comes into this program will be given out. That's our pledge to you as a church board, okay, and as pastor. Um, in a minute, the ushers will come. We also want to give our condolences to the Ellis family on the passing of Terry. Um, we go back, uh, Vera and I go back a long way with the Ellis family. We've known them since 1975, which is probably longer than a lot of you have, have been born. <laughs> I'm dating myself, but great family, great family of God, great faith. And uh, Tim and Terry and P the Pulaski family, Catherine Pulaski, uh, big extended family. And uh, we just want you to hold them up in prayer this time of year especially, okay? Let's pray for the offering. Jesus, we thank you, Lord God, for this special season. Lord, we thank you, Lord, uh, that you have put your blessing upon your people in this church. Lord, we thank you for their faithfulness. Lord, we know, Lord, that you are the one who provides for all of our needs. Lord, and as you give to us, we give it out to others. And that's the principle that you've established. Lord, I pray, God, that as people pray for the pledges for next year and in faith initiatives, that we again far outseed the goal. Lord, that we can give this money out to places all over the world, touch families and people that are a lot less fortunate than we are, and that we'll have the funds to give for benevolence for those who fall on hard times in our own congregation. Lord, we thank you for all your blessings. Lord, I ask that you bless each family that's here today. Lord, that they have just a wonderful time as they share it with their children and grandchildren, Lord God. Lord, we'll give you the praise and the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. to babe on bended knee. 
excuse me while I'm carnal for just a minute, but weren't those the most handsome elves you ever saw? We were singing a song a little while ago, and the worship team's leaving me, and so that's okay, we won't sing it. But whenever we begin to sing, Oh, come let us adore him, I immediately begin to think of the greatness of our Savior, the greatness and the majesty of our God, who the song is written in so many ways that we would come and see what God has done and we focus upon the manger scene and the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes and I want you to understand and and in fear of preaching my message all right in the beginning the day that we celebrate the thing that we focus on is not just that scene in the stable where there's no room in the inn and the savior of the world the king of kings God with us it's not just about what happened there that day but rather about a gift that was gave this morning I would ask that you grab your Bibles and uh, as you're getting ready uh, Matthew chapter 27 and then we'll also be reading from 1 Peter chapter 1 I want to mention just a couple of things to you want to remind you of something that you would have heard in the announcement video about the fasting guide. Uh, These are at the happenings wall and I'm sure there are probably other places, but I would ask that you would consider joining us next year with a renewed focus on God and His vision and purpose for us as a local assembly and that you would consider doing a fast with us. There are Uh, a number of different ways that you can go about this and that's what you will find within this pamphlet that we put together for you but I want to give you just a small tidbit of clarity when it comes to your fasting there is a reason why we why we fast why we push away from the table and many people after the first of the year will push away from the table and gym attendance will skyrocket and People will stop going to Starbucks and buying their 50,000 calorie drinks for about three to six weeks. And then they fall right back into the same old routines. But when we fast, we fast that we might might subject our flesh to the Spirit of God. That we might allow our flesh to become beat down, wore down, and we spend intentional time building up the spiritual man. That in doing so, we might have greater clarity when God speaks to us, when God gives direction. And I would, I would just encourage you, please consider this in the coming year. God has spoke great things to us. I would I would invite you to come back on New Year's Eve. We will be having a service, and I will be giving you the vision for 2019. And and it's uh, it's overwhelming, to be honest with you. But only when I look in the mirror and I think, how am I supposed to do any of this? And then I hear the Lord gently remind me, hey, dummy, let me do it just be faithful and so I would I would ask that you would consider uh, joining us on a fast and that you would be here on New Year's Eve the other thing that I want to mention to you is our life group sign up you've been hearing about this I love my church the church is made up of more than brick and mortar it's more than this physical representation that we drive by and see when we pull in the parking lot but the church is made up of of individuals it's made up of you 
we're going to spend some time talking about what the church looks like, what the church is, what the church is not, what the church does. We're going to talk about power. We're going to talk about authority. But there's a couple of things that you must remember. In order to be the church of the living God, in order to walk with true apostolic power and authority and anointing, we must first be people of the word and people of prayer. And so I would just challenge you that as you begin to make your plans for what you're going to make for resolutions, make a couple of them to include the word and prayer in the coming year. And uh, let's see what God will do in our midst. Amen. Matthew 27, verse 22, Pilate responded and he says, then what should I do with Jesus who is called the Messiah? They shouted back, crucify him. First Peter chapter one, verse 18 and 19, for you know that you were not redeemed from your vain way of life inherited from your fathers with perishable things like gold, like silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot. I want to pray this morning for this message. My title is simply this, my turn, my turn. As we go to prayer, I would also bring to you Brother Steve Mevis. This morning, I, I got a text that they rushed him to the hospital this morning. He had another seizure, and so we want to remember him. So many needs amongst the body. Uh, Ann Bevers, I had a text go out to the prayer team this morning. So much uh, that is going on, and, and uh, I would fail to mention all the names. But please, would you remember to pray? for the body this morning. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we love you and we thank you for your faithfulness to us. We thank you for your loving kindness, O oh God, for all that you have done, for all that you've given. I pray this morning for these needs that we have lifted up before you. We pray for Steve Mevis. We pray for Ann Bevers. We pray for Roderick Billups, God. Lord, we know that uh, there are so many that are struggling, some that are here represented within this congregation, others who are represented as an extension of this body and we know that there's a need in florida and we pray for that need even right now god that you would touch there and you would give strength there lord but be attentive unto our cry this morning i pray oh god also for the word lord that as it goes forth it would go forth as good seed and it would find its home in good soil this morning lord anoint my words this morning let them be your words help us to receive what you would say to us in jesus name amen you may be seated in just two days it's it's christmas christmas it's hard to believe i keep telling my wife just think in a few days christmas is over and she says don't remind me she's got a little pouty lip and she's sad and but we spend so much time and so much energy and so much focus on Christmas is coming. We got to get ready. We got this to do. But it will be here in two days. And many will be gathered to celebrate a tradition. A tradition that, frankly, I hesitate to say this for some of you, but a tradition that really has not very much to do with Christ. While it could, it centers more on self, centers more on me, than anything. How many presents will I get? What will I get? Well, will it be something I really wanted? Will it be the thing that I've always wanted? Will this be my best Christmas ever? We sit and look with a twinkle in our eye as we, as we gaze at all of the gifts and the, the wrapping paper that's so colorful and the bows and the tinsel and we wonder which ones are mine. What's inside? We know the Christmas stories that are told depicting young children unable to sleep, awaiting the jingling of sleigh bells and the patter of hooves upon the roof, who rush down on Christmas morning to gaze in wonder at all the gifts wrapped so beautifully around the tree, hardly able to contain their excitement 
barely able to eat their breakfast or sit still as someone reads the account of the birth of the Savior. All awaiting the moment to come when they can exclaim, My turn. My turn. I wish Cameron was in here, but he's in Sunday school this morning, or I would pick on him and say he still does that. My turn. I love Christmas, as you are all aware, and I thoroughly enjoy the time spent with our children each and every Christmas morning, all the times of Dakota exclaiming, I knew it. He's got this, this hilarious, cute laugh. <laughs> I love it. I knew it. And he says, with every gift, is it what you always wanted? Or when he would open it, he would say, it's what I always wanted, every gift. How is that possible that we are that good? Cameron boldly, boldly exclaiming every time. I mean, it didn't matter if you had just read the label on your gift. My turn. Me next. My turn. Or Megan. Sweet Megan. Sorry, honey. <laughs> Content to play with the empty boxes more than the gift that came in the box. It was good when she was young. We didn't have to hardly buy her nothing. Just wrap a box. <laughs> but I am a blessed man, and I am thankful for the temporal blessings that God has afforded me. I love the traditions. I love the traditions still today of our children patiently waiting in their rooms, grown people, right? Adults for the most part, waiting patiently in their rooms for mom and dad to come and greet them with a good morning and a Merry Christmas before gathering together for breakfast, for the reading of the birth of Christ, and finally the opening of gifts. This morning, I, I want to share with you something that may it may forever change the way that you view Christmas morning and the tradition of giving and receiving of gifts. I pray that it might cause you to consider the greatest and most costly gift ever given to you, that it may cause you to remember this message or part of it for the rest of your life. Consider the opening text that I read to you this morning. The disciples in Christ have had their last meal together in the upper room. They, they have celebrated their last Passover meal together. They have instituted the memorial we know as communion. Christ has prayed in earnest while the disciples slept in the Garden of Gethsemane. He has watched as Judas came and betrayed him. He has listened and heard Peter since deny him three times. He knows that Judas has regretted his decision and is now having committed suicide hanging from a tree. Christ now stands before Pilate. Pilate before Christ. This earthly judge before the righteous, the eternal, the all-powerful, the holy judge. This is the scene before us. This is the intended place that God prepared. But Pilate finds himself in a quandary. Pilate finds himself a nervous wreck. He finds himself... At, uh, in a place of unease, he's struggling with a decision. He's struggling with something that is happening. His wife 
has warned him not to have anything to do with this one called the Christ. He has the hostile anger of the Jews and the seemingly unconcerned attitude of his prisoner. All the accusations of the priests. All the accusations of the elders. And there Christ stands silent. Pilate is faced with a question to which he poses, I would say, to which he tries to deflect to those that are gathered before him. What should I do with the Christ? Understand that this question is not just one posed to those gathered there that day. It is a personal question posed to each of us here this morning. It is a question that Pilate actually was hoping to avoid answering himself. It's my turn, but you decide. It's my turn, but I'm too young. You decide. It's my turn, but I have so much life to live. You go. It's, it's my turn, but today's not convenient for me. It's my turn, but can I come back another day and decide what to do with Christ. Consider, consider the pressure, if you will, that Pilate must have been feeling. Before him stands a prisoner that he knows does not deserve to die. He knows that Christ has not done anything that would warrant his death or his crucifixion. A prisoner that he longed to release. The pressure of the knowledge of the dream that Pilate's wife had come to him and shared and said, I had a nightmare and all night my sleep was troubled with this righteous man and the advice she had given him concerning the Christ. The pressure of the boisterous crowd clamoring for the blood of Christ compared to the quiet demeanor of this supposed king. I have to believe that Pilate with his question to the crowd that day was one of frustration and despair. He did not want to answer the question for himself, hence his posing it to the crowd, allowing them to answer for him. How many do this today? Allowing others to make a decision for them as it concerns what is to be done with Jesus Christ. It's my turn. But you decide. Here is the problem. While we may allow others to, to make this choice or to give this verdict on Christ, each of us, each of us will stand before him, the eternal judge, and give an account for the choice that we made, whether we feel we made one or not as it relates to the gift that he gave for our life. We will be judged for our response. Pilate, though he desired someone else to make the decision, he could not escape it as the final decision lay with him. What should I do with Jesus, he said. What do I do? It's, it's my turn to decide. Pilate tried to push the responsibility away from himself by washing his hands in the basin of water, giving the responsibility of Christ's fate into the hands of the mob that day. But he will answer just as you and I will for the response to Christ's gift. You see, it's my turn. This is the decision each of us has to make here today and quite frankly, for every day to follow. God came, robed, wrapped in flesh. God came wrapped in flesh, born of a virgin to gift salvation. The question remains, will you receive this great gift? I wish everyone within their self this morning would say, it's my turn. The Apostle Peter writes and he says, For you know that you were not redeemed of your, your vain way of life inherited from your fathers with perishable things like silver or gold. 
but with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish or spot. There is a call to a choice that requires an action. There is no neutrality within the question, for you see, it's my turn. You can choose to receive or to reject Him. You can choose to obey or disobey Him. You can decide to live with Him or you can choose to live apart from Him. But it's your turn. It's my turn to make the decision. Understand the gift that He gave. Freedom from death. Peace for eternity. Joy unspeakable. A future that is incorruptible. A hope that brings life forevermore. Ladies and gentlemen, He gave us a gift. A gift that we find the writer writing about. For God so loved the world that He gave. He gave us a gift. A gift of Himself. A gift of eternal life. And it's my turn. It's your turn to decide. I want us to consider the process of the gift. You see before me piles of gifts. This would be a good Christmas morning for me. She's probably thinking, yep, and they're all going to be empty or full of coal. But I want you to consider the process that the gift was submitted to. You know, we, we love Christmas. I love Christmas. I remember as a child, we, we celebrated Christmas until I was about eight years old. And then my, my parents, uh, through some reading, decided that we would abstain from the exchanging of gifts and the celebrating of Christmas. And, and so as a nine-year-old and a 10-year-old and 11-year-old and a 20-year-old, every Christmas was weird for me. I missed Christmas, but I remember as a little kid, I would sneak out after mom and dad went to bed. And somehow mom never said she knew that I had opened them gifts. But I knew what I was getting before I opened them. And I was more excited and I would think, could I get it out? And could I play with it and put it back? And they not know. Yeah, I was a rascal. I was a rascal. But think about the process of the gift. They're beautiful. They're wrapped. We spend time in making sure we have the right colored paper and the right tinsel and the right bows to put upon it. And on Christmas morning, packages like these will be submitted to a process that is required that the gift inside it might be revealed, that it might be made known. The process, if you will. I'm going to have some fun today. The process, if you will, of pulling, of ripping, of discarding, of tearing, of... I sure hope there wasn't nothing in that. <laughs> but think about the process of the gift of what it goes through in order that the gift might be revealed. That the prize might be exposed. This is what happened to the Savior. They battered the package. They battered the package so that his appearance was marred beyond recognition. They abused the wrapping, the package, despising it. They spit upon it. They pushed it. They kicked it. They yelled obscenities at it. Laid a tremendous weight upon it. Damaged it with a crown of thorns. Shredding the flesh. They whipped it. Flogged it. Beat it. 
nailed it to a cross. Ran a spear within it. Until the packaging became so torn and tattered that the gift within the package flowed freely. That whosoever would desire this gift might receive the gift of life. This morning, it's my turn to decide. It's your turn to decide. Will you receive the gift? Do you accept the gift that's been offered? Yes, it's Christmas. And we celebrate the birth of Christ. But understand that the coming of this child was that the true gift might be realized in our own lives as a result of his death, burial, and resurrection. You have no greater decision this Christmas as important as this one. Every other decision you will make in this life is temporary. It's temporal. But this decision is for all eternity. This decision determines your destiny, your future, your hope, your peace, your security for all of time. It's your turn. The question you are faced today is about Jesus. This is the question that everyone will answer. Not a question about a church. Not a question about a religion. Not a question about feelings or politics. But about Jesus Christ. You see, it's, it's my turn. It's my turn for how I will decide to answer the question. It's my turn to decide how I will respond to the gift. You see, he came that I might live. Not in this temporary life, but that I might have life for all eternity with him. He allowed the packaging to be despised, to be ripped and tattered. And I pray to God that on Christmas morning, as you hear that, as you hear the wrapping and you see the box discarded, as you see your children, your grandchildren, your friends, as they hurriedly unwrap, almost nearly despising the wrapping to find the gift. That you'll remember that he came as a gift for you. And you have been afforded an opportunity to respond to the gift. What will I Respond. How will I respond? Not to a gift of gold or silver wrapped with bows or tinsel, but rather a gift wrapped in flesh that was given to redeem me to him. He came as the gift. A gift that offers me an opportunity to repent of my sins, finding forgiveness from my past and my future sin, to receive redemption and justification by the blood applied in baptism by Jesus' name, to receive an earnest of mine inheritance through the gift of his spirit dwelling within me. I ask you this morning, how will you respond to the gift? It's my turn. I would ask that you would stand with me this morning. And I understand that this is not maybe the happiest of Christmas messages. But I'm sorry. 
Christmas is not just about tinsel and bows and paper. Christmas is not about a nativity scene. It's about a cross. It's about a gift that was nailed and lifted that I might live, that I might find life evermore. It's a gift of the blood that purchased my redemption. It is Christmas, and I pray that as you celebrate, as you tear wrapping paper, as you see others opening packages, that you will be reminded that God gave the costliest gift and that you would hear within your heart, it's my turn. It's my turn for truly it is your turn to respond to his gift of eternal life. This morning, if you are here and you've not yet responded to the call of Christ, He extends to you an offer today that you might come and repent of your sin, that you might come and be baptized in the precious name of Jesus, that you might receive the infilling of His Spirit the response is yours. I would also say this to you. At Christmas time, we are giving people by nature. And there are times we will forego gifts that we might give to someone else. Can I say to you today that the greatest gift that you would ever offer to someone is the gift that you've already received gift of eternal life share you have plenty I promise you won't run out but share this gift of life with someone that you meet this Christmas season I'm going to open this altar and I'm going to ask that you would come and that you would spend some time with the Lord this morning in prayer maybe a refocusing on it's really important this Christmas. Maybe reminding yourself of the gift that God gave you. And maybe that we have forgotten and taken for granted. If you are here this morning and you've not yet responded, I want you to know that we are here. We will help you. If you desire to be baptized this morning, we will help you. 
God loves each and every one of you so much that he gave, that he gave his blood that you might be cleansed, that you might have relationship with him. He loves you. He's calling you. It's your turn. How do you respond today?